you. Thank you know you're here. You have to help me escape before that monster comes back. I'm Centilla. I found a way out through the Gate of Horn, but it's locked. So I told him about it, and instead of helping me escape, he locked me up. He wants to keep us all here forever, or until we're turned to gold. He's a monster. You have to let me go so we can kill him and take his key. I don't know. He said the gods are on his side because they don't want us to escape either. Behind me, there's an aqueduct tunnel bringing water from outside the city, so it should lead us outside. The only problem is it's barred by a heavy locked gate, and he has the only key. Sentius. My adoptive father. Furies help me. I'll castrate and crucify him. I'm going to take that key from around his neck, even if it means cutting his throat to get it. I'm done caring about the golden rule. I just want out. Help me, and we can escape together. There won't be enough time. Just you and me. What do you say? you. I spit on you. I hope Dis drags you to Tartarus. You're back. Have you come to let me go this time? There's no time. Wait, did you hear that? What? No. You can't just leave me here. How can you be so heartless? It's no use. You'll never persuade him of anything. I'm telling you, he's a monster. Please. You're making a mistake.
Oi! How did you get in there, you cheeky little circus? Ugh, this place has become a thorough. Ugh, I wish a ra. Oh. What? But you should. We're finally alone. We. I must. Is that about? Seems rough. Me? What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, you remind me of him. Al. Al Worth. The fellow who came through the portal before you. Come now. Surely you didn't think you were the only one here who remembered everything. You see, my connection to the portal somehow preserves my memories from one loop to the next. Whether that was Proserpina's intention or a happy accident, I'll never know. But I'm surprised you hadn't noticed. Here I was, thinking you were a little bit sharper than Al was. Or perhaps you're just more willing to break the rules. He was a moralistic fellow, never once compromised on his principles. And because of that fatal flaw, he relived this day many thousands of times before we finally had this conversation. I watched him come through the portal each time, always a little older, a little more disheveled, a little more haunted. And when he finally saw the futility of it all, as you're about to, it broke him. He drank a jug of wine, tied a noose around his neck and took his own life just before he was shot with a golden arrow. The next time I awoke, you showed up, but you, you've caught up to where he was so quickly. I mean, you've lived through the day, what, less than 15 times? Impressive. And yet everything you've done has been in vain because there's no escape. Except the path that Al took, the path he wrote about on his tablet. What was it? Ah, yes. Best to take your own life now. So, you discovered my secret. So what? What are you going to do about it? Why? Isn't it obvious? Because I have grown attached to all this. My title, my beautiful villa, the sun on my face, the music of birds chirping. And as long as this day keeps repeating itself, I get to enjoy it all, over and over again, for eternity. Don't you see? I have found a way to prolong my life indefinitely, to cheat death. I have become, in effect, as immortal as the gods. Can you honestly say you would not wish the same for yourself? And why would I agree to that? You might want to think that through. If anyone so much as touches me, everyone dies. The only way you're getting this key is over my dead body. And if I die, I won't be able to open the portal for you again, meaning you'll have created a paradox. You see, it was my actions that brought you to this point in time. So if you kill me, you'll stop me from doing so. And you being here will be an impossibility. 
That means if I die, you'll be flung back to your original time, having caused the deaths of everyone here, and you'll never be able to undo it. Is that what you want? Oh, you and your pathetic morality. Nobody cares about your opinions or what happens, where you're from. Least of all, me. Understand that, to me, you've never been anything more than a useful idiot. And you're no longer useful. I certainly hope not. In fact, I want it to go on and on forever until you wither and die like Al did and the gods send yet another useful idiot to extend my life for me. What are you going to do? Beg the gods for help? <laughs> they don't care about you, and neither do I. Now, get out of my villa. I'm bored with you. I thought I told you to get out of my villa. I'm bored with you. If you're snooping around in my possessions, you're wasting your time. <laughs> Whatever are you wearing? <laughs> oh. Oh. What? Is this some kind of crude commoner joke? No, surely not. Father, is this true? I'm afraid it is. I, I don't understand. Why? Why would you do such a thing? Because you found a way out. And if you're wondering why I'm telling you this, it's because you're never going to remember any of it. All I have to do is commit a sin, and the day will begin again. Watch this. I'm going to kill you now. The many shall suffer for the sins of the one. Salve. Oh. You live. Poor bird. All right, let me. What? I'll go. Bird. Blessed Lissa. Am I losing my memory? Oh, that's a relief. For a moment, I thought it was I who was touched by madness. I assume you're asking me this as some kind of amusing hypothetical? Extraordinary. Then let me see if I can help you. I suppose first I'd want to gather information. I'd want to know about his reasons for imposing the Golden Rule and what he considers a sin. If I could expose some internal inconsistency in his reasoning, some degree of hypocrisy, I might be able to compel him to change his position. But as a philosopher, the saddest truth I ever learned is that all but the most enlightened opponents are more easily swayed by appeals to emotion than by reason. So the easiest path would be to find his emotional susceptibility and exploit it. If he was vain, I might try to flatter him. 
If he was merciful, I would try to evoke pity. As a last resort, I might figure out what he fears losing above all else, and, if I could, threaten to take it away. Though, of course, that could easily go awry. Now, go quickly while my words are still fresh in your memory.
And here you are. Allow me to introduce myself. As you have already gathered, I've been known by many names. Nergal to the Sumerians, Osiris to the Egyptians, Hades to the Greeks, and Pluto to the Romans. But the one constant through it all has been my title, God of the Underworld. And I've been watching you with curiosity, mortal, ever since your arrival. You are unlike the others, aren't you? And what is more, you carry a weapon that was never intended for mortals to wield, and you do it so brazenly. But there will be time for your reckoning later. First, as a reward for undoing the desecration of my obelisk, I will allow you to satisfy your curiosity. Ask what you will. It has come to be known simply as the Underworld, and it exists because of a wager I made long ago. That is a long story, one that began over 3,000 years ago and continues to this day. You see, long ago my kin and I set out from our home on Elysium to search for other forms of life among the stars. We discovered your planet and witnessed your kind evolving from primates into something lawless and barbaric. You all but destroyed yourselves, your too short lives being extinguished by violence and ignorance and disease. Yet Proserpina saw raw potential in you, and persuaded the rest of us it would be squandered without our intervention and stewardship. So we revealed ourselves to your people in a place called Sumer, we offered guidance in agriculture, toolcraft, and law, and you called us gods. For a time, you flourished, but soon you were too many for us to oversee. And as you spread from that cradle of civilization, we saw something disturbing. We had sown the seeds of dependency and confusion, and soon you returned to your old ways of violence and ignorance, this time in our name. My kin had seen enough, and gave up on your kind, condemning you as barbaric and chaotic, scarcely more than animals. We began preparations to return to Elysium, our home world, a utopia unspoilt by conflict and unimaginable in its beauty. But my Proserpina could not bear to abandon your kind without guidance, and knowing it would force the rest of us to leave her behind, she made an extraordinary sacrifice. She gave up her immortality to descend permanently to the ranks of humankind. And so she began her inescapable trajectory toward death. Horrified, I acted swiftly. I placed her in suspended animation in a deep frozen sleep to prevent age and sickness from claiming her. And then I pleaded with Proserpina's father, who the Romans called Jupiter, to bring her with us to Elysium. It was and is my hope that once there, we might one day learn to undo what she has done to herself. But he refused. I did everything I could to persuade him, but he would not relent. He would rigidly uphold his final pronouncement. Humans were unworthy of ascension to Elysium, and no exceptions would be made. But seeing that I was aggrieved, he proposed a wager, the terms of which were as follows. If even one human city could prove itself capable of living without sin for a single year, then Proserpina and all of humanity would be permitted to join us in Elysium. My part would be to remain behind, the last of my kind, to watch over you, without interfering, and to sit in silent judgment. And so my reward has been to languish here, enduring a 3,000-year winter, waiting for the day your kind proves itself worthy of her faith in you, so that I might take her with me to Elysium and unthaw my goddess of springtime. And here I am, after all this time, still waiting. There were also gods who, like me, have been known by many names, but perhaps you knew them by their Roman names. 
Our leader, Jupiter, as well as Neptune, Saturn, Juno, Minerva, Mars, Venus, Apollo, Diana, Vulcan, Vesta, Ceres, and of course, my beloved Persephone. As the first wave of your kind arrived from Sumer, I had them build a city in their own fashion, so that they might be comfortable and recreate their lives here. I had them build the entrance as a vertical shaft leading to baths, to cleanse them of the sins of their former lives, and to prevent escape. I watched wave after wave of Sumerians arrive, and as their civilization declined over the centuries, they were replaced by Egyptians. Of course, believing themselves to be the superior civilization, the Egyptians promptly built over what had been built before, and made all the same mistakes. After another thousand years, the Greeks began to arrive, and then the Romans, and they all did the same thing. They built upon the underworlds of their predecessors, renamed their gods, and ensured their foundations were forgotten. To ensure the wage was fair, it was important that my subjects were chosen at random. To this end, I had my servant distribute a thousand tokens fashioned from silver, a rare element at the time, across all of Sumer. Whoever died while in possession of one of them would be located by my servant and ferried to this place, with no memory of how they arrived. As the tokens were discovered, they were traded, smelted, and fashioned into trinkets, and eventually coins, spreading to Egypt like seeds on the wind. Later, when they spread to Greece, they would come to be known as Charon's Obol, or as coins for the ferryman. Some placed coins in the mouths of their dead hoping they would awaken here, though they had no way of knowing which coins were fashioned from the original tokens. In fact, almost all of the tokens are accounted for, only two remain. And so after this wave destroys itself, as it is destined to do, your kind will have squandered the last of its potential to ascend beyond this rock, and Persephone is along with it. It is a regrettable story. One of the first men who came to this place was a king of Sumer and a troublemaker. To be rid of him, I returned him to his people on the condition that my servant erased his memories of this place. But the erasure did not take completely, and he told stories of this place as if describing memories of a dream. His tales were committed to writing, which came to be known as the Epic of Gilgamesh, and his words were twisted and distorted over generations. Later, the Egyptians would adapt Sumer's stories of the underworld, making them wildly intricate and labyrinthine. Their Book of the Dead and Book of Gates bore less and less resemblance to this place in their priest's pursuit of profit. Then, when the Greeks began to arrive, they proved far more cunning. And in a series of incidents that will not be repeated, five of them escaped. A warrior named Heracles, two kings named Sisyphus and Theseus, a poet named Orpheus, and a Trojan named Aeneas. They each told embellished tales of this place, how to get here, and how to escape. And so from Sumer to Egypt, Greece to Rome, your kind has always told each other stories about this place though each story contained only a seed of truth. Of course. My story is many thousands of years long. You will need to be more specific. What do you wish to know? My kin and I all adopted this form long ago, so that we might better understand and communicate with your kind. In time, we grew fond of the sensory delights it affords. Desire, joy, ecstasy, even rage and sorrow, while an acquired taste can be addictive.
It is a matter of perspective. God is a label I was given by you mortals, not one I gave myself. Your ancestors revered me because to them, my knowledge and technology made me incomprehensibly powerful, just as you might seem so to an insect. But despite all that, there are rules even I must obey. No. Long ago I swore to Persephone that I would remain in this form for as long as we remained among your kind. I must honor that. This is my beloved. Like me, she has been known by many names. Eresh Kigel to the Sumerians, Isis to the Egyptians, Persephone to the Greeks, and Proserpina to the Romans. Or perhaps you might know her as the goddess of springtime, the cycle of life and renewal. Your gaze lingers too long. That is my servant. You would have met by the river, though she wears many faces and goes by many names. Kumu Tabal to the Sumerians. Kirti to the Egyptians, Charon to the Greeks, and Charon to the Romans. Her role is to ferry souls between the mortal world and this one, and to make their transition as seamless as possible. For that, she earned herself the infamous, if erroneous, moniker, the Ferryman. You will talk more later. For now, ask your questions. As you wish. That is merely the name your people have given to it, but yes, it is my doing. That is a story dating back to the very first wave. After the Sumerians finished building their city, the self-declared ruler threw a banquet to celebrate. Now this man was unmarried, and many women were vying to become his wife, a prestigious position of power and influence in a new world. Of all the women, two were particularly ambitious. Both were beautiful, and both arrived at the banquet wearing eye-catching dresses and painted faces, their hair woven in elaborate fashion. The first woman, recognizing that she would require an advantage to win the ruler's affection, draped herself in jewelry, ornate necklaces, bracelets and rings fashioned from gold. Seeing this ostentatious display, the second woman grew envious, for she had no such jewelry at her disposal. She prayed aloud to any gods that would listen to cover her in gold, and when her prayer went unanswered, she took matters into her own hands. While the others indulged at the banquet, the second woman summoned the first for a discussion in a quiet place. She checked that nobody was watching, and pushed her rival from the top of the ziggurat where she broke her neck on the rocks below. But I was watching, and I decided to answer her prayer. I took the golden bow left behind by Diana, and I shot that woman in the heart, covering her from head to toe in a layer of molten gold. And I left her to stand there, that she might serve as a grim reminder of what befalls those who sin in my domain. But that was not enough, for the entire city was tainted by her sin, and the wager could no longer be won. So I had no choice but to wipe the slate clean. I gilded them all to make way for a new wave, and began the wager again. And to this day, each of them and all who came after line the halls of this city, inanimate but conscious, suspended in time with only their sight and hearing preserved, so they may bear witness to and lament the folly of your kind for eternity as silent golden sentinels. I give your kind a second chance at life, as well as ample warning about my law. And when you disobey, and you always disobey, you force my hand, bringing terrible suffering upon yourselves. And so you ask if I am the one destroying your lives. And I say, 
No, you destroy yourselves. I am merely the means by which you do it. When my kin departed, they left behind many relics which I inherited. A consolation prize of sorts. The golden bow originally belonged to one of my kin, who the Romans called Diana. As my collection of golden statues grew, I chose the most ferocious among them and equipped them each with a duplicate of her bow and tasked them with hunting down the Forsaken at my behest. They became known simply as Furies. I am able to commune with all of the statues in the city. Their ears are my ears, and their eyes are my eyes. If she was still conscious, I suppose she could, but she's not. Why do you ask? Then what an odd question. I've always considered that the cornerstone of morality is the ability to determine right from wrong on one's own. No attempt to lay out rules like your Code of Hammurabi or your Twelve Tables of the Roman Republic can ever cover all possible scenarios. This should come as no surprise to you, since the core principle has been expressed in many forms by many of your civilizations. The Egyptians made a rudimentary attempt with do to the doer to make him do. The Greeks refined it with avoid doing what you would blame others for doing. The Roman Stoics added, treat your inferior as you would wish your superior to treat you. Even the so-called cultists hiding among you often say, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It is the simplest of concepts, and each one of you is born with the faculties required to apply it to any situation. Yet none of the peoples who expressed this rule were able to uphold it. Curious, is it not? Enough. You clearly know nothing. Do you plan to speak in sweeping generalizations, or are you going to give me an example? Ah, yes. The debt bondsman. Taking one's own life is a self-directed act. It is not one that is done to others, however they may be affected by it. Therefore, it cannot be said that one who commits suicide has done anything unto others. Now tell me, what other sins do you believe I have overlooked? The merchant. How is that inconsistent with the rule I've outlined? I disagree. Having watched this merchant, that is precisely what he would expect from others, and he would be quite capable of paying the price anyway. Applying this rule always requires speculation to some degree. It requires us to ask what another person would want if they found themselves in another situation. Not if we're wise enough to know the mind of man. Hmm. Supposing you're right, then my law has been broken, and I should turn you all to gold immediately. Is that what you want? Hmm. Huh. Now tell me, what other sins do you believe I have overlooked? You speak of the moneylender. How is that inconsistent with the rule? And he would never have signed a contract pledging his labor for 30 years. All he did was enforce the terms of a contract signed voluntarily by others.
ignoring your irritating sense of moral superiority. This is interesting. I'm curious, how do people escape poverty where you're from? I see. And how long might it take such a person to repay their debt? I fail to see how your system of loans is significantly different to a debt bondsman signing over his labor for 30 years. Now tell me, what other sins do you believe I have overlooked? The midwife and the palace, yes. How is that inconsistent with the rule? The rule is do unto others, meaning other people. Those statues are something else now. Bloodless shadows, mere shapes of their former selves. They are forsaken. What happens to them is no concern of mine. Applying this rule always requires us to interpret the meaning of the words. A literal interpretation helps to minimize the ambiguities of your primitive language. Hmm. Supposing you are right, then my law has been broken, and I should turn you all to gold immediately. Is that what you want? Huh. Now tell me. What other sins do you believe I have overlooked? Abduction? You mean the magistrate imprisoning his daughter in the cistern, I take it? He did so because she sought to escape. A sin I take particularly seriously. Better that he stops her from escaping, albeit brutishly, than I have to wipe out this entire city to punish her. Wouldn't you agree? Now tell me, what other sins do you believe I have overlooked? Do you honestly think you could do better? I should strike you down for that. Huh. Now, did you have any other questions before your reckoning? Very well. Good. Then now it is time for your reckoning. Only, it seems, something is wrong. It has long been within my power to see into the hearts of mortals and weigh their deeds in life. But when I peer into you, I see only a blank slate, as if you did not exist until you appeared in this city. How is this possible? Charon, where did you find this one? I do not remember ferrying you. How did you come here? If that is true, then I sense the intervention of someone powerful. How did you come to be in this time, mortal? Who brought you here? He cannot know. I do not know. My kin departed long ago, and Proserpina has slumbered for 3,000 years. Tread lightly, mortal. Enough of this. It seems I will need to put your reckoning on hold for now. But answer this. Why have you come here? What is it you seek? <laughs> your hubris is amusing, so I will allow you to make your case. But I warn you. If you anger me, you 
or waste my time with lies or wrong-headed arguments. You face death here. So, tell me, why should I put an end to the so-called Golden Rule? How so? And be specific. You have made a grave allegation, and I expect you to back it up. True. I had witnessed him doing that. His cruelty does seem to grow greater by the day. He is a volatile and confused fellow, that one. Pathetic. You will need to do a lot better than that. That is a very serious accusation, mortal. What sin have I committed? What evidence do you have to support it? Every one of those people was guilty of failing to ensure their peers lived virtuously. They failed collectively, and so they were punished collectively. The Romans understand this, as did the Greeks before them. Ah, but I am a god, and you are a mortal. Why would you expect me to treat you as I treat my own kind? You are not a peer. You are not a respected equal. Let me ask you this. Do you treat insects as you wish to be treated? Do you care for their well-being as you would your fellow man? Do you ensure they have food and shelter and protection from predators? Do you give them rights? Of course not, because that would be absurd just as it would be absurd for me to treat your kind as equals. My love for her does not mean I am not superior, now that she is mortal. Where to begin? Our lifespans exceed yours by thousands of years, in which time we accumulate vast wisdom and a mastery of technology you cannot begin to imagine. Because that is the source of our power over you. Hmm, you could say that. My kin have no superiors. Hmm, that is true. Go on. 
Make your point, mortal. Let me ponder that for a moment. If you are right, then it would follow that all this time, I have been in the wrong. But no, the very thought of it aggrieves me. How can I accept your argument when doing so would make me a tyrant and a monster? Wait, what? What are you saying? You have spoken eloquently, and yet, if what you say is true, it follows that my wager was fatally flawed from the beginning. But that would mean Jupiter, Preservator's father, who knew more about you than anyone, proposed a wager I could never win. Why would he do that? A mistake, but he is the best and greatest of us. Ugh. Your words sting me, mortal. But perhaps it is what I deserve. As difficult as this is to admit, I have suspected as much for a long time now. And I cannot deny it any longer. I've been so fixated on taking my beloved to Elysium that every time one of you sinned, it wore away my hope of being with her again. In time, I began to despise your kind for making her believe that you could ever be better than you are. But my rage was not born of malice, quite the opposite. Everything I have done, I did because I loved her. Who knew this empathy of yours, which you celebrate so much, could have such a dark underside? This has gone on too long. It is time for me to let go of this form, of her, of all of you. But know this, if I abandon the way journey for Elysium, neither she nor your kind may ever ascend. Because doing so would violate the rules of my sacred agreement with Jupiter, and you would receive a hostile reception. The best I can do is return you to the land of the living. I will have Charon make arrangements to ferry the others. But as for you, be aware you will be separated from the rest. Once this exodus begins, the events that brought you to this moment will never have taken place, and you will have created a paradox. What will become of you is difficult to predict, but that is the risk you have taken by interfering in the natural flow of time. Now, are you ready? Farewell, mortal. Oh! 
Uh, hi there. Gave me a bit of a fright. Thought I was in here alone. I'm Al. Well, here I am. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Know who you are? I barely remember how I got here myself. Oh, did that lady in the forest send you in here after me? I guess I lost track of time, learning about the history of this place, and it is extraordinary. I'm fairly certain you and I are the first people to set foot in this city for about 2,000 years. Fortunately for us, the last person in here was a Roman man named Galerius, who inscribed an account into a tablet. Apparently, there was a community of 20-something people trapped in here, and living in fear of a curse they called the Golden Rule. They believed that if even one person sinned, an unknown god would cast them all into gold, like the thousand people who'd lived here before them. Then, one day, just as Galerius had finished praying for a good harvest at the Shrine of Proserpina, an oracle appeared and told him how to solve the ills of the city, like, and so on. Meanwhile, the oracle walked up to the temple of the mysterious god, this one right here, and demanded an audience. And the doors just opened up to him. Nobody knows what went on in there, but Galerius wrote the oracle must have been more persuasive than Odysseus, because the next thing he knew, the ground shook and the voice of that god rang out over the city. The many have suffered long enough. Unfortunately, Galerius' account just sort of stops after that, leaving a lot of questions unanswered. What became of him and the other people who lived here? What happened to all the golden statues? And did this mysterious oracle single-handedly undo the curse that had terrorized people for hundreds of years? I don't know, it reads like an earnest account to me. Anyway, I think I found a way out through the aqueduct that brought water into the city. Follow me. I'm going to pause here for a moment and make sure nobody else is ever lured into this temple. You go on ahead, and I'll be there soon. You're back, but you're alone. 
Does that mean you didn't find Al? Oh, what a relief. Thank you so much. I was beginning to think you'd both become trapped in there. Why don't you tell me what you discovered? While we wait. Ah, I see. I thought you might. Well, now you know. I suppose you have questions. You can just call me Charon, if you like. I am sorry I was not completely honest with you when we first met. I do not enjoy deceiving people. Believe me, I do not. But I have learned, from 5,000 years of experience, that most people find comfort in familiarity, in gradual change, and coming to see the truth in their own time. That you died, of course. You were dead when I brought you here. My role, as the servant of the god of the underworld, has always been to assist the chosen to cross the threshold from the land of the living to the land of the dead. Hmm. Usually, when people do not remember how they died, it is because they suffered a terrible trauma. Most souls would rather not remember. Ask yourself honestly, do you really want to know? As you wish. You were murdered. You made a purchase in a marketplace, and the change you received was, by mistake, a single silver coin of ancient origin. You were seen inspecting it, and soon after, you were set upon by two thieves. The shopkeeper who had given you the coin saw the scuffle break out and leapt to your aid. You both fought bravely, but your assailants were armed and you were not. There was nothing you or your ally could have done. He died instantly at the scene, and you followed a few hours later. That man's name was Al Worth. You were each in possession of a sacred coin, called Charon's Opal by some, and so it was my duty to bring you here. It means, I am now bereft of purpose. There is nobody else to ferry here. Nobody to keep you company. After 5,000 years, the underworld has finally run its course. Perhaps you have heard the tales of the Greeks and Romans bearing their dead with a coin in their mouths to pay the ferryman for passage across the river. Well, those stories contained a seed of truth, but not any coin would do. A long time ago, my master created a thousand silver coins and had me distribute them across the world. My orders were simple. Whenever a person died in possession of a coin, I was to locate them and ferry them here. It means, I am now bereft of purpose. There is nobody else to ferry here. Nobody to keep you company. After 5,000 years, the underworld has finally run its course. I see no point in keeping you here. But I have to ask one thing. That you keep this to yourself. Look! Here comes Al now. Al! It's so good to see you. You were gone so long I thought I'd never see you again. Kinda lost track of time in there. You wouldn't believe what we found. The ruins of a long forgotten city. And there was a tablet describing an oracle who confronted a god and undid an ancient curse. Sounds like quite a story. And I look forward to hearing all about it. But... You two look exhausted. 
Why don't you hop in my boat and rest while I... ferry you back to civilization? Sounds good to me. And you? Are you ready to go home? Hey, you made it. It's great to see you again. After everything you've been through, I thought you might appreciate some... good news. So after we got back to the real world, I started doing some research into the people mentioned in Galerius' tablet, and I found something... strange. I'm... sorry I've been so cryptic. I've been dying to tell you, I just... really wanted you to see this for yourself. Why don't you head on down there? I'll catch up with you at the other end. You're finally here! Remember me? It's a crazy story. After you disappeared, Karen appeared and told us she was returning us to the world. Even gave us some coins to help us start our lives over. Only, for some reason, she returned us to your world instead of ours. Anyway, I know we only ever had that one conversation, and I wasn't even sure if you'd remember me, but I wanted to say thanks for freeing us from the underworld and giving us a second chance at life. Oh, I used Karen's gift to buy a farm in Umbria. Got a villa on it too, with enough room for Dooley, of course. It's hard work, but I sleep soundly every night. I'm finally my own man, and I... I wouldn't change it for the world. I know! I can't believe my luck either! But we're engaged and living together. We're planning to get married next spring. If you're gonna be around, we'd love to see you there. Of course, there's a whole museum full of people waiting for a chance to thank you, so you'd better keep moving. We'll speak again soon, my friend. Oh, hello. You're here. It's so wonderful to see you again. There he is. So, you're the hero who somehow vanquished the last of the Roman gods. As I'm a priestess, you realize you've put me out of work. I'm just teasing. Actually, and it still feels a little sacrilegious to say this, 
I'm finding life after religion quite enjoyable. Galerius and I are engaged and expecting. We've just bought a lovely villa in the countryside, with room for a large family, and Dooley too, of course. It feels like the world has just opened up for us. There's so much to learn, and so many more possibilities for our children than we ever imagined. We're just so thankful for what you did for us. For all of us. Oh, it's sweet of you to ask. She recovered nicely. In fact, she's here somewhere, if you'd like to ask her yourself. See you at the wedding, I hope. Back again? Of course, there's a whole museum f There he is! Hello, I'm Dooley. Galerius said you're very nice and a big helper. Thank you for getting us out of the bad place. I didn't like it. I live at Galerius and e Equitia's house. They look after me now and help me remember when I forget things, like brushing my teeth. Treasure? Oh, I forgot about that. I like my box now. Galerius got me a box that tells stories. It's my favourite thing. Yeah, they're fun. Bye bye. You're. You're the Oracle, right? Oh, of course, sorry. And I never got a chance to thank you for telling Galerius how to save my life. And of course, getting me and all of us out Hi of there. a terrible situation. Oh, I barely recognize myself. I'm living in a house share in London with my wonderful girlfriend. And I'm studying English at university. Eventually, I want to travel the world and write about it. Turns out, it's about 30 times bigger than the Roman Empire ever was. Did you know there are entire continents Rome never knew existed? And you can travel almost anywhere in an aircraft, which is rather like flying on a Pegasus, but much more comfortable. Oh, sorry, you already know all that, of course. I'm just so excited. There's so much to see and learn and write about. I have noticed people from your time have no idea how fortunate they are. I hope to change that. One day. Last I heard, Maliolus kept insisting he was the last rightful ruler of the Roman Empire and wound up being committed to a psychiatric hospital. As for Claudia, she was always so viciously unhappy. Someone says she'd blown all her money on wine, trying to drink herself back to the underworld. After the horrific way they treated Ulpius and me, I can't help feeling a sense of... What's that German word? Schadenfreude? Thank you. You're very kind. Ugh. Someone told me she was boasting about getting her claws into some rich prince, and how she was going to be living the high life from now on. Even in your time, life still isn't fair. Apparently, he'd proposed before they'd even met. And last I heard, she'd bought herself a first-class one-way ticket to join him in some exotic place called... What was it? Nigeria? Some people have all the luck. Well, you are the Oracle so I suppose I'll take your word for it. Huh. I feel better already. Thank you. You too. 
If you're ever in London, let me know. We can go to bars and drink wine and listen to the stories of the nine million people who live there. I hope so. Hey. It's good to see you again. I understand we have you to thank for giving us a second chance at life. And reuniting Santilla with us as well. So, thank you. I'm living up north and studying in the military academy in Modena. I'm going to be an officer one day. The world's changed a lot. But some things stay the same. Would you believe we're still studying military tactics from my time? Alexander the Great, Caesar, Hannibal Barker... Still, I have to keep challenging myself to let go of old ways of thinking and embrace the new. As Seneca wrote, the ones who pioneered our paths aren't our masters, but our guides. Ah, oh, you remembered that. Thank you. I grieved for a time, but that's done. In the words of Epictetus, as those who rode behind triumphant generals remind them they are mortal, remind yourself your precious one isn't one of your possessions, but something given for now, not forever. Thanks. He's not my... Oh, I see what you did there. Good one. He had more trouble adapting than most. He got himself disqualified from the UFC. So he started some kind of underground blood sport tournament. Like we had in Rome. Suppose it appealed to people's baser instincts. And they say he made some good coin, killing a bunch of men like that. But his luck finally ran out. And his life along with it. You know what they say. Live by the sword, die by the sword. Hmm, perhaps. And you, farewell. Hey. I take it you're the Oracle. Thanks for coming. Actually, I changed my name to Cynthia. I didn't want to be associated with Sentius after what happened. I'm not sure if you heard, but after you drove Pluto off, Proserpina emerged from the Great Temple. She knew right away what none of us had figured out about that psychopath. He'd been keeping my little sister locked up in the upper cistern all that time. But he's been dealt with. He's... Uh, you know what? The important thing is, we'll never see him again. Anything I want. I'm a woman of means in a vast new world. I can go wherever and do whatever I please. Of course, I mostly just stay in my villa and have my servant Alexa summon things for me. Because it's just awful out there. Barbarians everywhere. He's still there, all alone. The last golden statue in the underworld. Trapped in a metal shell, slowly losing his mind until the end of time. Eternal torment. Just what he deserves, if you ask me. Then I suppose he'd got his wish. You too. See you around. You are here. It's nice to finally meet you. Lucy is fine. I'm making an effort to blend in, as you can see. We are all trying to keep a low profile. If the world knew we died 2,000 years ago, and were suddenly brought back to life 12 months ago, they'd never leave us alone. Speaking of which, I wanted to say thank you in person. 
I'd say the gods smile on you, but I hear you drove the last of them off. So... I'm studying to get into medical school. As much as I resented the responsibility of keeping everyone in the city alive, when it ended, I realized I missed it. So I guess I'll just keep saving the world, if begrudgingly, one patient at a time. Oh, ah, she didn't make it. She died from poison while you were in the great temple. It was very sad. She was a good woman and a friend. It wasn't your fault. Decius is to blame. He's here somewhere too. Not that anyone would talk to him. I'm not even sure how he got invited. You too. Don't be a stranger. Greetings. You must be the legendary oracle. It is a sincere privilege to finally make your acquaintance. I am Georgius. I am told we have you to thank for freeing us from Hades, and for that I am most grateful. I am reacquainting myself with Greece. It has changed so much over the last 2000 years, I barely recognize it. This is at once heartbreaking and thrilling. Perhaps one day, once I have seen all of this new Greece and sampled her delights, I will settle down in Sandorini in a villa overlooking the Azure Aegean Sea. I hope you will join me there and regale me with the story of how you faced off against the fearsome god of the underworld and won. Ah, the poor sweet thing perished in a shrine collapse before the rest of us were saved. It is the one regret I have in all this. My friend, there is no need for you to apologize. You have done more than enough. You too, my friend. Hello. You're the one we've been waiting for. I'm Fabia. I wanted to say thanks for sending Galerius to save my life. I don't know how you knew, but I would have been crushed by that shrine for sure. I'm just so happy to be here with you and everyone together again, even if it's just for one more night. Well, it's not like I have to work with all the silver Caron gave me, so I just do what makes me happy. Mostly that means baking for my friends and looking at memes while binging TV shows in yoga pants. <laughs> what a time to be alive. Oh, it really is. You too. And here you are. It's wonderful to see you again. Oh, and by the way, I go by Philip now. A fine Greek name. I never thought I'd leave that cave, let alone the city. And now I'm living in the 21st century. What a time to be alive. And it seems I have your catabasis to thank for it. I'm working as a consultant to the Faculty of Classics at Cambridge Uni. Not that I need the money. Aha, you remember that. I have to admit, I have been profoundly impressed by the advances humans have made these past two millennia. The sum total of human knowledge available at our fingertips, miraculous modern medicines, and a series of prosperous democracies. Your contemporaries have come further toward utopia than I ever thought possible, though there's still a way to go. My sincere thanks once again. Good evening. Oh, hello. It's lovely to meet you. I'm... but... I'm living in Rome again, in a charming little flat by the Tiber. I'm not far from my old place. Oh, and I'm training to be a crisis counsellor. After you sent Galerius to persuade Ulpius not to take his own life, I was inspired. 
I just want to spend the rest of my life helping people, like you helped him. Thank you. That means a lot. And you. Oh, and I hope this is wonderful. We meet again. Thank you for your kind words and for liberating us all. In all the time I was in the underworld, I never once imagined that I might end up Hello in a there. place so much like Elysium. I'm recovering. Octavia was kind enough to let me stay with her for a while, at least until I'm well enough to be independent again. She still talks wistfully of you. Ah, you remember that. I'm a little tired of Ovid, but that's all right. I have 2,000 years worth of poetry to catch up on now. I'm already up to the 19th century and am quite enjoying the work of a fellow named Poe. I think I may have found a kindred spirit. Men have called me mad, but the question is not yet settled whether madness is or is not the loftiest intelligence. And you, farewell, friend. Some soiree, innit? Ah, oh, hello at last. You must be the oracle I've heard so much about. I'm Dacius. Listen, I wanted to express my sincere appreciation for what you did. If it wasn't for you, I'd never been able to sell all those useless old relics I accumulated. Whatever you did in that temple made me a very wealthy man. Thank you. Such a serbic wit. I love it. I took the money I made from selling my trinkets and started investing in the stock market. That's where the real money is now. In fact, I was hoping to ask your advice, you being the oracle and future seer and all that, on which stocks I should invest in next. I can't decide between fossil fuels, tobacco, gambling and arms. What would you recommend? Oh, don't be like that. You can tell your old pal, Dacius. I won't take no for an answer. Oh, of course, yeah. I was just thinking the same thing. I'll go home and buy up as much stock as I can tonight. I'm going to make a bloody fortune. <laughs> of course, don't let me keep you. Thanks again for the tips, my friend. It is an honor to finally meet you, Oracle. You know my name? Oh, of course. You are an Oracle. You know many things. I too would like to offer my thanks for releasing us from that place and for your role in bringing us here. This world is truly wondrous. For a time, I returned to Alexandria, but they have no need of another fisherman. And I came to see there is nothing for me there. Instead, I have decided to follow the custom of your youths and backpack the world. It is a great adventure, and I have met many people from many cultures. I spent the first 25 years of my life avoiding the 42 sins that would deny me access to the afterlife. Now, I think it is time I had some fun. Indeed. Thank you, Oracle. Nice to meet you. I go by Rufus now. New start, new name. Oh, and uh, thanks, by the way. For what you did. Sorry, I'm no good with the mushy stuff. I live with Virgil in Rotterdam, not far from where he grew up. It's very modern. 
destroyed in the war and it rebuilt itself. Good place for a fresh start. I haven't decided what I'm going to do with my life yet. Hmm. One adjustment at a time. Huh. Good to know. Anyway, it was good practice for the new world. Security cameras and smartphones everywhere. Got to stay vigilant. Mm. You too. Look us up next time you're in the Netherlands. I'm... We're grateful. It's so nice to finally meet you. I wanted to... And for helping Rufus come to terms with himself. He may come off a little gruff, but once you get past that, he's a lovely fellow. I'm studying to be an architect again. Of course, it's improved immensely since I was there last. You natives of the 20... You too. As Rufus said in his own laconic way, if you're ever in the Netherlands, we'd love... Hello there. Oh, I go by Gabriella now. I didn't want to be reminded of that monster every time I heard my own name. You didn't hear. My adoptive father, Sentius, locked me up in the upper cistern to stop me from escaping. After you drove Pluto off, Proserpina came and released me, and that monster got what was coming to him. Mm-hmm. I'm living with Ulpius on a little vineyard in Umbria. It's even more wonderful than I dreamed it would be. I'm so grateful to you for making sure he's still with us. If you're ever passing through the region, I hope you'll come and visit us. You can try some of our very own wine. Thanks. You too. It's nice to finally put a face to the name. I'm Ulpius. I understand I have you to thank for sending Galerius to save my life. The way you just showed up out of the blue and stopped me from making a terrible mistake, I'll be forever in your debt. I'm living with Gabriella in Umbria. We finally bought the little vineyard we always dreamed of. It'll be a little while before we know what we're doing, but every day I look at her and this extraordinary new world with all its beauty and I think what if I'd given up hope and missed out on all of this so we're living each day to the fullest and we end them all the same way sitting together on our terrace with a glass of our wine which the locals say is almost drinkable now and watching the sunset over the rolling hillside and I couldn't be happier. Thank you. I wouldn't be here without you. You too.
There you are. I hope you enjoyed that. Now, there's one more person I wanted to introduce you to. I think you know her. <laughs> Sorry if I frightened you. Just a little joke I've been saving for a long, long time. Allow me to introduce myself properly. I am Prasathana, former goddess of the cycle of life and renewal, and now a regular mortal. I wanted to meet you in person, and thank you for freeing all these people, and me. I hate to think what would have happened to us without your intervention. Indeed. Suffice it to say that while Pluto was controlling the eyes and ears of each golden statue, I was able to control their tongues and whisper to you when he was distracted. I am sorry my messages were so cryptic. There were only ever brief windows in which I could speak to you without being detected. I did. I may have given up my immortality, but I still retain my gifts as the goddess of the cycle of life and renewal. After witnessing Pluto punish countless poor souls over thousands of years, I knew this generation, the final wave, would not survive. So I tried to give them a way to buy more time. A second chance. Rather as many second chances as they needed to avoid his wrath. So I whispered to Sentius in secret, telling him the prayer required to create a portal in my shrine. I knew the danger of humans being corrupted by godly power. And so I put a safeguard in place. I required the creator of the portal to sacrifice their own life. So that it could only be used selflessly to help others. What I did not anticipate is that Sentius would retain his accumulated memories from each previous day. And as a veteran soldier, he had long since shed his fear of death. He quickly discovered that he could, in effect, prolong his own life indefinitely by exploiting the cycle. Of course, once I had taught him the prayer, I could not unteach him. And there was little I could do but wait for someone like you to come along and see him for what he was. We were all fortunate you came along when you did. I don't know what happened to him. I haven't heard from him, and I rather hope it stays that way. Oh, she inherited dominion over the underworld. Last time we spoke, she was working on a new world of some kind. She wouldn't say what it was, but I'd be surprised if you don't run into her again. I imagine we all will, one day. And you, although it feels like I've known you forever. Oh, and one last thing. Do you remember all those golden statues scattered throughout the city? Good, because they remember you. Well done, my friend. Of all the heroes who ever journeyed to the underworld in return, none came close to achieving what you did. Hercules, Orpheus, Theseus, and Aeneas would be proud 